Hey, hi everyone. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for tuning in. Uh, today I'm in San Jose um, with um, with uh, Jagdeep Singh, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, quantum scape and solid state power. But before I do that, <clears throat> I have to uh, make a few uh, announcements, I guess. First off, no, I'm not um, uh, being paid for this. No, I don't have any stock in anything that has to do with battery technology. And uh, no, I'm not fooling around with Tesla stock anymore either. I haven't got any stock, thanks to all you uh, folks who like to sell short and criticize. So what I'd like to do is just jump right into this. And, um, and you know what? The first thing that I think everybody should know a little bit about is, is your background. When I was doing my research and whatnot, I was uh, really impressed uh, about coming from, from India and, and, and jumping straight into a university and graduating early and whatnot. I, th I think people would like to know a little bit about that, Jack D. Could you? So yeah, I actually um, grew up um, around the world. Um, my dad was uh, uh, in the, the World Health Organization as I was growing up. So I, I was born in India, but I left when I was four years old. I moved to a bunch of different parts of the world, Africa, Jamaica, ended up in Maryland when I was 15 at the, in the Washington DC area and, and started at the University of Maryland in computer science, graduated I was lucky enough to finish uh, you know, uh, at 19, came out here to California uh, to work at Hewlett Packard um, and, uh, and never left. You know, this is, um, I remember coming out here um, thinking that, you know, I, I always wanted to start a company. I remember coming out here thinking that, um, that I was too late to start a company because, you know, all the uh, interesting companies had already <laughs> been started. <laughs> this is back in, yeah. in the late 1980s. Uh, so uh, this goes to show that, you know, there's never an end to innovation, right? So. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you, you certainly uh, certainly impressed me in, in walking around. I got a chance to see the lab and whatnot. Um, and I, I would just like to maybe um, have you talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the, the, difference, the, the difference between your, bat, your solid state battery and what we see with the uh, 4680 from Tesla. Um, we were talking about you know, density and weight and things like that. Maybe you could elaborate a little bit. Yeah, so the 4680 is uh, essentially the same basic chemistry that's used today um, with the addition of some additional silicon and some additional, on the anode, and some additional improvements on the cathode side relative to, you know, nickel content and, and uh, uh, dry electrode processing and so on, plus some packaging improvements like the tabless design and so on. So um, what we're doing is uh, really a different chemistry uh, in the sense that instead of using a traditional anode like a, a carbon or carbon silicon uh, hybrid anode, uh, we essentially do away with the anode completely. Mm -hmm. So in our case, uh, there is no host material, and the lithium that cycles back and forth inside the cell, from cathode to anode and back, simply plates itself uh, on top of our solid state separator as a layer of pure metallic lithium. Mm -hmm. Because there's no uh, host material like carbon or silicon for it to intercalate or diffuse into. Uh, and that's really what gives you all the benefits of this approach. So by eliminating that anode layer, uh, you, you eliminate the, the volume and the mass of the anode, uh, and um, uh, you, you gain the energy density benefits of, uh, uh, of our approach. Um, you also get the benefit of um, uh, increased um, power density, because one of the bottlenecks to fast charge in today's uh, chemistries is the time it takes for lithium ions to diffuse into those carbon particles. Right, so yeah. if you eliminate the carbon particles, you eliminate that bottleneck, and now you can charge the cells uh, you know, as fast as the cathode can deliver electrons to uh, ions to you, which is uh, you know, uh, 15 minutes, right? Yeah. So that was one of the things uh, when you show me in the slides and whatnot. You have a new slide deck that uh, that uh, just came out, and um, and I'd never seen the slide before, but I was really impressed with um, how the description was that you were using a, a solid metal lithium um, uh, product instead of Instead of the uh, uh, the normal, what I would normally see inside of a inside of a um, inside of the, half the pouch, as it were. So um, that's one thing. Uh, but the other thing that I was impressed with was uh, the um, the separator that you're using, which uh, you have that little illustration uh, where you're kind of like bending the uh, the ceramic mm -hmm. separator. Uh, maybe we can dive into that for a second. Yeah, I mean that ceramic separator is. The heart, at the heart of the whole innovation here, right? Because that ceramic separator is a material that allows lithium ions to propagate through it, uh, you know, at about the same rate as it do through today's liquid electrolytes, uh, but it prevents lithium metal 
from penetrating it. And lithium metal, of course, is what uh, dendrites consist of. So right. uh, that basically uh, uh, allows lithium ions to go but stops dendrites. And that allows you to use a pure lithium metal anode, which in turn gives you all the benefits of higher energy density because you don't have the, the, material, the volume required for the anode. Um, it gives you higher power density because you don't have the diffusion bottleneck of conventional anodes. Uh, it gives you uh, uh, better life characteristics because you don't have that chemical side reaction that happens between today's liquid electrolytes and the carbon atoms. Um, uh, and it gives you uh, improved safety because um, the ceramic itself is non-flammable and non-combustible. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's thermally stable to north of 1,000 degrees, whereas today's polymers uh, will uh, melt and burn up less than 200 degrees. So all those benefits stem from that yeah. one material. Yeah. Well, the one thing that, uh, that um, I think there's a, a fair amount of confusion on, and, uh, and you've cleared that up as well, people are saying, um, oh, oh my gosh, uh, QuantumScape is lying because they, they, they do have a liquid in. Um, and uh, so they're, they're saying that it's really not a solid state battery. But to me, I couldn't really figure out how it was going to work. And now that you've explained it downstairs when we were going through the briefing, um, it might be good for people to know that, yes, there is a little leak with liquid in it, but the real key is the, um, is the separator and, and the lithium metal. So yeah. why don't you go yeah, on yeah, a little let, bit? Let me explain that. So first of all, um, uh, the fact that we have an organic electrolyte uh, consisting of you know, a polymer and a liquid combined into an into a, a organic gel-like material uh, has been in our public disclosure since the S4 was filed yeah. you know, way back last year. So that's been fully, 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 fully transparent about that. The, here's the important point. All the benefits that we're talking about, from energy density to fast charge to uh, safety uh, to, um, uh, to uh, uh, cycle life and cost, they really stem from the solid state separator, right? That's the material that is both an ionic conductor and an electrical isolator. So it isolates the anode from the cathode that prevents dendrites. That material is what allows you to switch to a lithium metal anode, right. and the lithium metal anode delivers all these benefits to you. Now, in a normal <coughs> cell, you have, you have uh, ionic conductors, the electrolytes, uh, that span three parts of your cell. There's an electrolyte in the cathode to allow ions to move from the cathode all the way up to the separator, electrolyte in the separator itself, so the ions can move through the separator, and electrolyte in the anode as well. So that all three layers have electrolytes uh, in them, and electrolyte right. is the same liquid that floods the whole cell. Now the requirements for electrolytes in the cathode are different from those in the separator. If you're making a solid state separator, um, you have two requirements. One is it has to be conductive, uh, like a liquid, but two it has to prevent lithium metal dendrites from forming. Fortunately though, the separator is very thin. Uh, it doesn't need to be quite as conductive as the cathode does. The electrolyte in the cathode, on the other hand, because the cathode is very thick and because the path of ions is tortuous, it has to work its way around the, the cathode particles, the cathode needs much higher conductivity than the separator does. But fortunately, the cathode will never see lithium metal, so it doesn't need to stop dendrites. And that's where we stop by the separator. So those are different requirements. And we don't know of a single material that can meet both the requirements. Right. In fact, every other approach that we're aware of uh, that tries to meet both requirements ends up not preventing dendrites, and that's a fatal flaw. So mm -hmm. by making a separator that meets the dendrite requirement uh, and isolating the anode from the cathode, that frees us up to use any cathode in the cathode. Right? And the one we've chosen to use uh, for our first generation uh, is this organic material, a combination of a polymer and, 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 a, and a liquid. Um, uh, but, but that's really irrelevant to the fact that the cell can use a lithium metal anode. So when we say solid state, we're of course referring to the solid state separator, which is what enables the lithium metal anode that delivers all the benefits. Mm -hmm. So um, I also, um, in, in reading and whatnot, heard that you had a, two uh, different, uh, uh, different separators that, uh, that you had looked at, and you kind of like went down parallel paths and chose one. <clears throat> are, you, are you looking at still the one that basically got shelved or, or is that, yeah, so, uh, so is that let me, if, it's out? a good question. Let me back up even more. When we started the company, we started with kind of a computational approach and looked at a bunch of different, you know, many, many different types of materials uh, based on their, uh, their, their uh, uh, theoretical properties. We ended up synthesizing and making in our lab probably on the order of, you know, certainly more than, you know, uh, yeah. more than 10 different materials probably. Um, 
of those 10 or more materials that we, that we actually synthesized and tested, uh, we ended up with two that were finalists that could have been contenders. And of those two, there was only one that ended up preventing uh, dendrites, and that's the one we're using for the separator. Mm. The other material could still be used as a catalyte, uh, but, uh, it, but it doesn't, uh, it's not going to work as a, as a, as a separator. Uh, and the material that we're using is the only one that we know of that can prevent dendrite at these levels of current density. Now, dendrites are an exponential function of current density. So as you increase current density, you, you more than linearly increase the propensity to dendrite. So there will be a current density at which everything fails. So the only question that matters is how much headroom does your system have? in terms of what current density you can tolerate before dendrites compared to what's needed for the application. And the data we've shown was that we were able to drive our um, uh, material uh, as high as 100 milliamps per centimeter squared, which is literally you know, uh, you know, more than five times higher than what you would ever see, even in a fast charge situation, and more than order of magnitude higher than what you would see in a, in a regular driving situation. So, so we feel pretty comfortable with that material. It's quite robust. And we're not aware of any other material that could deliver that level of, of current density at you know, unelevated temperatures, so at like 30 degrees instead of 60, 70, 80 degrees without dendriting. So that's really the key result. So short answer to your question is, we did end up with two finalists. Only one of them was able to prevent dendrites. That's the one we're currently using. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I'm not going to ask for the secret sauce, but, um, but can you, um, can you kind of explain a little bit about uh, what that separator is? Yeah, so what we've said publicly, it's a ceramic material, um, you know, and um, uh, 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 we haven't said what the composition is. Uh, we like to keep that, um, you know, uh, uh, confidential. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's uh, a secret but, sauce I don't need to know about. Yeah, but, but we, you know, the most important thing really is, is what's the performance of it? What's the behavior like? And we have released a lot of data on that front, right? So, for example, mm -hmm. you know, we showed you data this morning uh, uh, on the thousand cycles, right? Yeah. And again, what was important about that was not only that there's a thousand cycles that we got to north of 80% uh, capacity retention, but that that was done under what we consider to be uncompromised test conditions. So we didn't elevate temperature to 60, 70, 80 degrees, and we didn't lower the current density to levels that's not practical. So, you know, both those issues, you know, uh, 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 either elevated temperatures or um, uh, uh, low current densities would make the cell impractical for real, real cars, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I was very impressed with the uh, the little description that you gave me about that, and even more impressed with the fact that, you know, I keep hearing all this stuff uh, by, I don't know, analysts or reporters or somebody, but they they keep stressing that uh, there isn't enough testing and there's nothing real data here and on and on, and yet there's been plenty of experimentation that uh, that tells me anyway that these these things are working. Um, maybe not to, not to the scale that there are in a car, but certainly the direction seems to be going in, in, in the right way. Yeah, I mean, Sandy, I'll be completely candid with you, right? If, if someone wants to criticize quantum scape, right, it's a valid criticism to say, you guys haven't built this in mass production yet, because we haven't. We haven't put up the factories yet. That, that's a true thing, right? We're working on that, right, and we think we can get there, but we haven't shown it yet. Yeah. But it's completely ridiculous to say that we haven't made the material. We've, we've made, you know, we've run millions of tests. We've, uh, we've shown, we've published the data. <laughs> uh, we've shown that the material can cycle uh, to levels that haven't been seen before. I mentioned 1,000 cycles, 30 degrees Celsius, 1C, 1C rates, so high rates of power with thick cathodes. Um, we showed that data on single layer cells, and then we followed up and showed that with four layer cells. So uh, I think that the way we see ourselves, um, the question of does there exist a material in nature that can function as a solid state separator? That we've proven uh, we can. And by the way, it's not just that we've done millions of tests in house. Our customers and prospective customers have tested these cells. So VW mm -hmm. alone has run tests on multiple generations of cells, culminating, of course, in the test they did in Q1 on our latest generation of cells. Uh, and and uh, uh, you know that generation has, you know, um, dimensions that are uh, in terms of thickness and, and, and area of the separator that's, that are close to production intent uh, uh, dimensions. Uh, and that test not only was successful, but it caused the release of $100 million in, in investment. So there's been lots of, you know, um, what we consider to be, you know, highly independent testing, which is not test labs that we're paying, but customers that are paying us. So they have a higher bar in terms of what they expect. So that, 
the, you know, the, I think what's been shown very uh, convincingly is that we have made a, a material exists in nature that can do this, and our team was lucky enough to, through a lot of hard work, 10 years of work, find it yeah. and make cells out of it. Um, but, you know, but if someone wants to criticize us, the valid criticism is, well, you know, um, we haven't put into mass production yet. And, and, and that's something that, you know, that we're, we, you know, we'll take time, and when we do it, you know, hopefully yeah. those, 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 those uh, uh, voices will, will, you know, uh, will, will quiet down as well. Well, one of the things that, uh, that has been coming up as well is when will this get into the marketplace? Um, I've heard uh, 2025, 2026. What, what, uh, what do you think your real number might be? Well, I mean, right now, we believe we're on target to a 24, 25 time frame. Right? Yeah. Uh, and, and the way we get there is very simple. Um, I mean, I'll give you the, the full breakdown. You know, we made single layer cells that we showed in December of last year, mm -hmm. so a few months ago. Uh, by uh, February this year on the earnings call, we had shown four layer versions of that cell, but in a smaller form factor, 30 by 30 millimeters instead mm -hmm. of 70 by 85. So instead of like a deck of cards, it was somewhat smaller. Uh, we told um, our investors that our next milestone, next big milestone uh, this year is going to be to make those same four layer cells, but in the full size form factor of 70 by 85 millimeters. And then by end of the year, we'll have eight to 10 layers of that mm -hmm. full size format. By sometime next year in 2022, we'll have a few dozen layers. That will be what we call the commercially relevant prototype sample. Uh, that'll be similar to what will go in actual car. And by 2023, we'll have cells rolling off our pre-pilot production line uh, from a building 10 minutes from where we are right here. Uh, and we'll show it to you today if you guys have time. Yeah. Um, uh, and that will produce enough cells. That'll produce hundreds of thousands of cells per year, which is enough to make hundreds of cars. Uh, and that's when we'll see real cars. So by 2023, we expect to have actual cars um, on our OEM test tracks with our uh, mm -hmm. batteries in them, real packs. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and we'll be in parallel building the production factory. As you might recall, we're doing this joint venture with VW. Uh, where right. We're building a, a, a factory with them, a 20 gigawatt hour facility uh, to mass produce these cells, produce in these cars. And that's what we believe will then be online in the 24, 25 timeframe. Uh, so 10 gigawatts is a, 20. Is a uh, sorry, 20, 20, yeah. 20 gigawatts is a big number. However, um, we're looking at uh, Tesla talking about like terawatts of power and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. What's your ramp up schedule? Uh, first off, are you, I, I'm assuming that you're going to be building your your uh, uh, your factory, your battery factory in Germany or someplace in Europe. Anyway, um, what is there any plan for any of the uh, local um, uh, any of the local um, um, OEMs um, here? I mean local being Honda and Toyota's local, so is Ford and GM and whatnot. Have yeah, you got yeah. So, going on? so we're working with a number of OEMs besides VW. The good thing about the VW deal, is, as, uh, as important as that is to us and as, as great as it's been for us as a, partner, as, as, a, as a partnership, it's not exclusive. So yeah. VW understands what they're getting out of this is the right to be first with this technology, yeah. but they know that we can build a company and sell to other players as well. So we, we, you know, and we can ship on, the, on day two after we ship with VW. Uh, so they've been great partners, but they, they understand that part of it. Uh, and so we have been working with other OEMs. Um, you know, uh, the, the factory we're doing with JV, the JV with VW, that's just for VW's needs. So for other customers, we will be building our own factories, and we'll be building some of those factories right here in, in, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and, and uh, the separator, uh, we will, um, you know, uh, even if we do a JV with another partner, the separator will always be made here. Because mm -hmm. that's that's one of the secret sauce, as you said. Um, so, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, we, we we expect to have multiple factories producing this. Now, the point I made about Tesla scale. One thing I got to hand it to Tesla that, that that they've done well is they've they've uh, they've been, you know, uh, uh, they they they've been bold in their thinking. Right when they set up the yeah. the, the Gigafactory. People weren't talking about 40 gigawatt hour factories, right? Uh, but but they did a great job of that. By the way, the, the, one of the key guys that drove that whole gigafactory is JB Strawell. So JB's right. on our board, right? He's he's yeah. just an amazing right. individual. Uh, so we have the benefit of his his advice and counsel. Uh, and now they're talking about terawatt hours of factory, which I think is is awesome for the industry. Um, and so one of the things we'll need to do is is absolutely get up to that scale. But the reality is, you can't go from zero to terawatt hours, right? You have to go through the intermediate steps. There's no, mm -hmm. there's no way around that. You can't go from a, 
you know, an engineering line like we have in this building uh, to a terawatt hour, you know, factory, right. you got to go through this gigawatt hour factory stage. That's what we're doing. Yeah, that that's all. Uh, that's that's good uh, good information. But if we're going to get to the crossover point, and I'm pretty sure that it's going to be 2028 or maybe mm -hmm. even earlier, mm -hmm. uh, so that there's more than 50 percent of the at least uh, uh, cars and light trucks, 50% um, uh, EV as opposed to ICE. If we hit that, the biggest obstacle is batteries. Absolutely. Um, batteries with less cost, batteries with um, less weight, mm -hmm. and uh, batteries with more range. Absolutely. So that's what I'm kind of trying to figure out. How, how is the battery, or whether it's solid state or anything, how are they going to ramp up because it's going to go like a hockey stick. It's not going to go... A hundred percent. Yeah, we, we couldn't agree with you more. We, we think that the, this industry um, uh, is, you know, uh, this, this transition is about to just take off in a, in a, in a really uh, uh, serious way. Uh, and so the, the challenge you are laying out is exactly the main challenge that we have for this business. Is how do we scale up capacity in a way that's fast enough? Look, this, this, the, the product we're building is not demand constrained. Right. There is, from our, where we sit, near infinite demand for it. Our question is simply, how quickly can we build capacity? Right? Now, the reason why we think it's doable is because the cathode that we're using is, is uh, essentially the same as what's used in today's battery. So there's no new um, you know, uh, breakthroughs required there. Mm -hmm. um, the separator that we use is different, and it's really where the secret sauce of value added is. But it's made from a number of precursor materials that are commodities. So they're already shipped in volume uh, for different applications in different industries. So even at a 20 gigawatt hour scale, we use a small fraction of water supply of those materials. And two, the manufacturing process for that material is a continuous flow process. It's not a batch process. It's not a semiconductor like high vacuum process. Yeah. So that means that the system, the inherent materials are scalable. And what we got to do is just actually scale it. So we got to get the tools, we got to build the factories, we got to get the supply chains going, all the things that you need in the manufacturing plant that you know well because you've worked with manufacturing for a long time. Yeah. Um, that's not, those things are not trivial, uh, but what they require is execution and capital. They don't mm -hmm. require new laws of physics. Right? That's why we think this is doable. Well, I, uh, I, I know one thing that, uh, that right now is turning into a giant problem for anybody who's making standard batteries, let's say, um, and that is the separators. Um, and so you having your separator, which is totally unique, uh, is probably going to be a big benefit. But I'm just wondering if there's, uh, there's some, like you could never do that on a cylindrical battery, but if you went to a pouch battery, somebody else's pouch battery, LG or whoever, mm -hmm. would, would your separator um, fit in and, uh, and work? Or would yeah. it be, because if, if you can get rid of the dendrites, yeah. Obviously, that's going to be, no matter what it is, it yeah. should be. Yeah, so, so uh, the, the, the separator is clearly, um, you know, the key secret sauce, but it's not the only part of the design that, that there are some other changes you need to the rest of the cell to make it work. So, um, you know, uh, 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 if, you, if you just literally dropped in our separator in there, um, that wouldn't be enough, they would need, which is why we're making cells, not just separators, right? We, 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 the other design yeah, aspects right. of the you cell know, well, I'm just it. saying, yeah. would it work? Yeah. Would it be something worthwhile? That's why I was asking the question about what yeah. happened to that second version. Yeah. Okay, so if, if, if the second version that you had, the one that mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. set aside, if it worked good enough mm -hmm. for uh, the rest of the battery, could you have like yeah, two question. markets? That's, I think that's a good question. Um, well, you know what? That's a that's a good idea. We'll have to think about that. Uh, Wait a minute. Weird. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> no, I mean, but, but but I think the reason why for the primary material, you know, we're not doing that is because um, you know, um, uh, a there are the cell level uh, changes that have to be made, but b, um, you know, uh, uh, we we think the real value creation is in supplying cells to the automotive OEM, yeah. uh, not in being a material supplier to the cell companies. Um, and that's kind of what we're doing. So um, the response you know, that we've gotten from the automotive OEMs has been so, you know, so compelling that we feel like that's been the right choice. I will give you a little anecdote. When we started the company, we thought we might be actually making packs as well. So we were triply we hey, wait a minute. Have you read this? Uh, that's my next question. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> no, I haven't read that. <laughs> well, you know, we, we saw we started with separators, which we make in-house. Then we make cells based on separators. And we thought we'd also be making packs. 
and right. selling entire facts. We thought, you know, we, we want to be involved in the BMS and so on. What we realized, and I'll be, you know, <laughs> transparent about this, was that there was enough work in figuring out the chemistry that that was sucking up all of our bandwidth, and we didn't have the cycles to work on, on the pack. Uh, and luckily, mm -hmm. fortunately for us, the pack uh, has turned out to be something that the OEM see as an integral part of the vehicle design. So they mm -hmm. don't really want us or need us to make packs for them. So the, the typical model for most OEMs is that they, they, they buy cells from their battery provider and they, they engineer the packs themselves. And it kind of makes sense because the cell is a simple two-terminal device. It has a positive electrode and a negative electrode, and that's it. Yeah. Whereas the pack is this, you know, is this multi-headed beast. It, is, there's, you know, it has a mechanical interface to the car, electrical yeah. interface, software interface, BMS, you know, thermal, all those things. And then, and then structural, like it's a part of the, 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 literally the, the physical integrity of the vehicle itself. If it's done you know, as a real EV, um, uh, as opposed to kind of bolting on a pack into a, mm -hmm. you know, a traditional combustion car. And so it's just so tightly integrated with the, with, the, with the vehicle that it's better for the pack to be done by the OEM. And all we do is a cell because it's a very clean handoff. So that's kind of where we are now. Mm -hmm. we're, we're only doubly vertically integrated. We make the cells and we make the separator that goes into the cell, but we don't make the third layer of the pack. Right? Mm. Well, another thing that I was kind of impressed at was the fact that you've got basically uh, a three-shift engineering um, operation. Um, a long time ago when I was a kid, um, that used to be called um, um, the American work ethic. Um, that's kind of like fallen by the board. As a matter of fact, um, I was just listening to um, uh, a, a, a sad HR person saying that um, American, were, uh, American engineers and scientists are overworked and they should have either a six hour day or maybe four days a week at eight hours, but with a two hour lunch or some damn thing. I can't remember everything because I got up, I, I had to do something else. Uh, I'm, I'm really impressed. Uh, I, I was impressed with the work ethic at Tesla. Oh, I, I was overwhelmed. And, and it sounds like you've got the same sort of dedication and work ethic here as, as what Tesla does. Well, thanks, Andy. We're very proud of the team because they, these guys absolutely are committed to the mission and they work really hard. The three shifts, you know, actually it's five shifts in the whole week, right? Uh, 24 yeah. by 7. You really have no choice if you're doing material level innovation because it's a very Edisonian process, right? right? You can't know, you know, a priori what material is going to work. So you know, after you come up with your, you know, um, uh, material candidates, you simply have to just make all the different flavors and variants of those materials mm -hmm. uh, to try out the whole design space, the whole parameter space. And um, the only way to do that is to, is to make a, you know, is to have a very short cycle time where you make a material, test it, get the feedback and make a new version very quickly. Yeah. Uh, and we were always striving to, ha to try to have a 24 hour cycle time, which means can we actually make the material, uh, uh, make a cell, test it, get feedback overnight. Um, and um, you know, sometimes we get there, sometimes we, we don't, but, but it's a lot better than the multi-week cycle that you traditionally have for development. And right. you know, um, just think about it for a second, if it takes you, so for example, if um, I don't know if you saw all the test tools we have down there in the lab. Um, yes, but, I did. Yeah. Uh, so the big benefit of owning all that ourselves is that we can literally run the tests overnight and characterize what we've made. So we make a material right. overnight. We get the the metrology and the, all the analysis back, so you know you know what what it is. If you didn't have all that equipment, you have to send that that material out to a, a third party lab for testing, and that would take about a week to get the characterized the, the, to get it characterized, right? If you're week really means, lucky. Yeah, that's yeah. like a five to seven times longer. So if it took us ten years to do this with our own tools, we would have taken 50 years. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. this so. is one of the things that I, I, I cannot understand um, why it is that the, uh, the major OEMs haven't quite caught on. I mean, Tesla has kind of shown everybody that, hey, you know what, vertical integration is not bad. Um, they, they're creating their own aluminums and things like that. You are doing 24-7 uh, with, with engineers here. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see them jump. I haven't seen one person jump out this window so <laughs> far. But, uh, but I mean, um, yeah. I don't understand where this other frame of mind is coming yeah. from. Yeah, I, I, think, I think I totally agree with you. The idea of vertical integration is, is really, is really <clears> key <throat> because that's the way you differentiate. If, you, if you're not, we believe if you're not vertically integrated. I'll be honest with you, if you look at the traditional battery companies today, right, if you were to take apart a Samsung cell versus an LG chem cell. Uh, if I didn't show you the label on the cell, I think you'd be hard pressed to tell which is which, right? Because they yeah. buy the same cathode materials from the same suppliers, the same anodes, right. the same separators, the same electrolytes. 
And, you know, the differentiation is, you know, um, in how they assemble and put it together, but uh, it's not a huge level of differentiation. Whereas what we're doing is, you know, we have this separator we're building that's unique, and then we build a cell around it that's unique. And so mm -hmm. it's just more differentiated, which means there's more opportunity to create value. Uh, so I, I agree with you. I mean, it, that, that uh, vertical integration can be a really powerful way to, to, to create value. It does require more capital. Um, you know, uh, and, and so we've been lucky. We've had, you know, Tesla's obviously been able to raise a lot of capital over the years in public markets. Um, and, and a lot of companies look to the, the, um, the lowest capital kind of path. Uh, mm -hmm. But as a result of that, sometimes they end up with a, a less differentiated product. And in the long run, we think we can create more value for our investors and our customers and our employees by, you know, maximizing value creation through this vertical integration model. Well, um it kind of like uh, drifted right into um, into the thing that I was going to talk about next, which is um, these really tough questions. Um, you've had a rough go here uh, for a while. Um, in December, your work, your worth about your shares were worth about 130 bucks a pop, and uh, now they're 30. Well, I don't know what they are right now, but I think they were 33 bucks uh, on Monday when I was uh, looking. Um, some of that. Uh, some of that happened as a result of your. Um, well, actually, I'm not going to. I'm not going to give you an answer. I mean, when 80 percent of the share price disappears, what what do you think the ration? What do you think happened? Well, so first of all, I want to start off by saying that you know we don't control the short-term stock market, right? The stock market is inherently volatile. Short-term yeah. stock prices go up and down. You know, Warren Buffett will tell you that um, in the short run. The stock market seems to be almost random, but in the long run, it correlates very well with value creation. Right? Right. So all we can do is create long-term value, and we believe that if we create long-term value, we will create long-term uh, you know, stock market appreciation, and all our investors will, will do well. A point of view that says, hey, QuantumScape, you guys have done a great job of showing materials and showing the cells can work in, in single and four-layer cells, but you haven't shown you can mass produce, so I'm going to stay on the sidelines and not invest in, in the company. That's a valid position to take. But what, what, what we have a problem with is when somebody does takes a short position on a Wednesday, puts out a, a report full of lies, misinformation, innuendo on Thursday morning, drives the stock price down because they spook you know, ordinary investors, and then covers their position the same day. So they're in and out in one day. Uh, <laughs> well, the, the company, people have worked here for 10 years and you know, working to create value. Uh, you know, and, and, and just innocent investors who just, you know, believe in the company's vision and mission uh, get hurt. That, in my view, is not okay. Because right? you're, not, mm. you're not doing anything other than, you know, uh, artificially manipulating the stock price. And, and part of that is what, what happened here. Look, you know, we're a public company. You've got to deal with these kind of guys that are out there. We fundamentally believe that two things. A, if we can execute. In the long run, we will create a lot of value for our investors and our customers, of course. And B, we believe we can execute. We believe the team has, got, has shown that it can solve some really hard problems. So in fact, I believe that the, problem of, the problems that we've already shown we've addressed, like making you know, single layer and four layer cells that can cycle uh, under these conditions, uh, was people have tried that for 40 plus years unsuccessfully. Right? Um, and now that that's done, the problem we have ahead of us is build factories. Well, the building factories problem, that's been done. People have built lithium ion factories before. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tesla put up the gigafactory in less than 18 months, I think, mm -hmm. uh, which, which means you know, we know that's doable. Um, now, one of the comments, let me just address this briefly. You know, I know Elon talks about um, how making a prototype is really easy and, making ma and manufacturing is really hard. Yeah. I want to make sure people put that in context, right? Because what he's talking about is, is the context of making cars, right? So putting together a car prototype is probably not that uh, you know, crazy difficult because you're, almost everything in the car is off the shelf. You've got suppliers supplying you with every subsystem that you're assembling. And then the manufacturing of the car, you may have like 10,000 parts that you've got to have show up on time and you know, if any one of them is late, <laughs> the whole line shuts down, right? So, so, so for a car, it may be the case that prototypes are easy and manufacturing is really, really, really hard. For a battery, it's really flipped around. The hard part is the chemistry. People spend right. decades trying to solve the yeah. chemistry, but once you have the chemistry, you can put up a factory in 18 months. Right? So we think in our world, the hard problem really was the chemistry. 
Uh, and, yet, and, and so while we haven't yet shown that we can mass produce these cells, um, we believe that, that we can get there. We have the capital to do it. We have $1.5 yeah. billion dollars in the bank. Uh, we have an amazing team. We got incredible customer support, uh, mm -hmm. and we got people that are on a mission. So we think all the pieces are there to do it. Uh, but again, if someone you know wants to be skeptical and says, you know, I don't believe you until you do it, that's it's a rational position. Of course, if we do do it, the stock price will be you know they'll, they'll get a chance to buy in at a higher price, right? That's that's the kind of yeah. the, the trade-off yeah. they make. Well, for me, um, I am. <clears throat> well, I've said this quite often. I, I really think that. Short seller. I don't. I don't understand short selling. Uh, of course, I'm not a. I guess I got a moral compass or something. But uh, but I don't really understand how it works. I don't understand why it's there. Um, and I, I mean, if somebody sold my house and uh, didn't tell me about it, <laughs> then and said, "Well, oh, I'll buy it back later on," yeah. I, I think I'd have a. I'd have a problem with that. Yeah. But uh, but. I, I wanted to get on to the customer because the customer is obviously uh, mm -hmm. VW. Um, inside one of the, um, um, I'm not, I, I don't know what to call these guys except for their names. So in the, um, in the Scorpion um, uh, 188 uh, uh, page mm -hmm. slide deck, um, they, were, they were saying that, um, they, were, they were saying that, uh, you know, uh, VW uh, is, they've got people saying, oh, this doesn't work at all. Who, who are these people that, uh, <laughs> that uh, came out of the woodwork? Well, so, and I mean, one of the absurd things in that report was that VW has never actually tested these cells, right? And, and I mean, it's such an absurd comment because, um, first of all, let me just provide some context here. VW has partnered with us for eight years. In those eight years, there's been many years during which they've had engineers embedded in our company, you know, in this building, yeah, yeah. who have had badge access to the lab that you got a tour of, and credential access to our database, uh, which all, with all the test results, which they didn't see. Uh, in addition to that, they've tested multiple generations of cells in their test labs in Germany, mm -hmm. right? uh, and the most recent one of which was this, which this last quarter in Q1, and the result of that was an extra hundred million dollars that they that they invested in the company. So. To say that they have never tested cells is just patently absurd, um, uh, uh, and, and it just shows that uh, that's just an indicator of the kind of thing where someone just wants to spook the investor, uh, mm. investors into, into driving the price down so they can make a buck. But it's not really even worthy of a comment. Um, as recently as VW's own Power Day, um, you know, uh, their head of, um, uh, of the battery group there said that this is uh, the end game. This is what they think yeah. is the end game for, for their battery technology. Right. So. Um, it just doesn't reconcile with, with those kind of comments. And, and you know, we, uh, the only way to explain it is that they're trying to put in there anything that they think will, will uh, you know, they're not, they're not interested in the truth. They're just interested in what will spook investors, you know, the ordinary retail investors in, into selling. Hmm. Well, to quote the guy from uh, Sharp Kink, um, he always says the same thing when he sees somebody uh, uh, basically uh, telling lies or whatever. He says he's going to sue, sue them into the dark ages. <laughs> Have you uh, considered that? Because quite frankly, if I was in your shoes, that's what I'd be doing. I, 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 whenever somebody says, oh, an anonymous source or a source that doesn't want to be named says, I, I immediately yeah. just skip over that paragraph. Yeah, why are these sources anonymous? If you, I mean, if, if, yeah. they're, if they're so, if they have so conviction, they're so convicted, why don't they, you know, um, you know uh, uh, at least want to share their names? Look, um, you know, our first reaction was, in fact, exactly that. Um, and, and uh, you know, we, we always want to do what's right for the shareholders um, in terms of, you know, making sure people don't, you know, there needs to be some deterrent, right, to these guys uh, doing this kind of stuff. But then the day, we think, um, you know, uh, uh, the best deterrent is um, uh, to continue to perform well, execute, because when the stock starts going up, these guys get a uh, squ short squeeze. They have to cover their position and start losing money. Because with a short position, you could lose you know, more than what you invested. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we don't want to get too distracted. We, we, we think we have, you know, um, um, nobody that we know is taking this report seriously. You know, it's just um, the customers all, you know, see what it is. So, so basically what we're focused on is, is execution. You know, if we deliver on the, on the milestones we have, I mean, the only legitimate concern that one could have about QuantScape is, okay, great, you've shown what you've shown, but you haven't shown, you know, uh, the scalability of this thing, right? And as we execute and show the scalability, 
that legitimate concern yeah. uh, goes away, and then I think the company ends up being you know being more, more valuable. Right? Yeah. I. Okay, so I have worked on pretty much every. I've said this before. Everything from Barbie to the space station, mm -hmm. and um, and um, I know, I know what it's like to try and put a car together. I've I've run programs mm -hmm. and whatnot, and mm -hmm. building a car is tough mm -hmm. if you don't have a lot of seasoned people helping mm -hmm. you out and putting it in a factory. Putting up a factory that's brand new is really a screaming mm -hmm. problem, but. If you have good science and you're making a product where, in essence, it's shooting down mm -hmm. um, a processing line at, uh, I don't know how many miles per hour that you're going to be doing this, but my guess is it's going to be 25 or 30 miles an hour, and it's just a, a single line processing, it's going to be a whole lot better if, if you can control the process, control the chemistry, and, um, and, and, and control the, the machines that are actually making it. I'd rather do that than almost anything because quite frankly, most of the time, I'm gonna be leaning in a chair, basically watching product go out the door. So I, I have the same, the same impression. Um, I think, quite frankly, that, um, that you should be able to uh, mint your own money if you wanna use that term. Um, but there's a couple of other contenders and I was gonna ask you about that Solid state power just got a, a few bucks from Ford and BMW. Are they a real contender, or do you know where your yeah, competition so, is? So, you know, um, uh, the, the key missing piece in solid state batteries has been the solid state separator, right? Yeah. And, and people looked at basically three main classes of material over the last 40 years, right? The first is polymers, like plastics, right? Yeah. Uh, one of our, you know, well, the head of our development team, you know, got his PhD in polymer physics out of Berkeley, so he's an expert in that area. And the polymers is they only work at elevated temperatures, right? right. And, and even then, the, te the, the, um, the conductivity is too low, so it's not really uh, real. Plus, they don't prevent dendrites, right? Uh, the other approach is sulfides, right? That's the approach solid power is using. We did a lot of work on sulfides here, so we know this system you know, uh, quite well. And the fundamental problem with sulfides is they don't prevent dendrites. Actually, there's a couple problems. One is they don't prevent dendrites. Uh, and so the only way to solve that is uh, either run at elevated temperature, 60, 70, 80 degrees, uh, along with very high pressures, because uh, high temperature makes the lithium softer, and high pressure then flattens it out, so it yeah. doesn't uh, have dendrites, or run at very low current densities, meaning very low rates of charge and, and discharge, which end up being not practical for real cars. Or, or accept the fact that it's gonna dendrite and you'll, you'll, the cell will short within a couple hundred cycles. Mm -hmm. Any one of those is, you know, one yeah. is catastrophic if it shorts, and the other two would make it impractical. So that's the problem with sulfides. The other problem that solid power doesn't disclose, and candidly, this is almost disingenuous, is that the sulfides, upon contact with atmosphere, react with the moisture in the air yeah. and form hydrogen sulfide. So hydrogen sulfide is a gas that's so toxic that it'll kill you at 50 parts per million, right? Mm -hmm. um, in fact, your nose can detect it at like yeah. five parts per million because it's, you know, we, we all evolved <laughs> uh, because we, we were able to detect those kinds of minuscule quantities because it's so toxic. Um, uh, but but those are pretty fatal issues, and if you can't solve dendrites, then it's not practical. So what what they're doing, uh, their approach has been to try to focus on the fact that they they can make bigger cells, and then they they want to come back and try to solve the underlying material later. To us, that's kind of doing it backwards, right? Why mm -hmm. would you want to try to scale up something that you know um, that doesn't work, right? Find a material that works. So mm -hmm. um, we, we we think that unfortunately that I mean. We welcome, you know, we welcome the recognition that, that lithium metal anodes are the best possible anode because they eliminate, you can't do better than zero, right? Lithium anode has yeah. no other yeah. anode, right? Yeah. Um, but, um, uh, but, but uh, uh, and so it's good the industry is, is moving in that direction and looking for ways to do it. But unfortunately, the specific approach that they're pursuing uh, with sulfides uh, it has some real challenges, and, and um, uh, you know, I, I'm not. We're not convinced that that, that they're, those challenges have solutions. And, mm -hmm. we, and we and we say that because we've spent a lot of time in those systems ourselves. We haven't just read papers and and, and uh, you, know, uh, you know, just looked at it. We've actually worked on it. So, um, uh, you know, and, and um, uh, I think that all the players you mentioned, the BMWs and Fords, um, they are. Um, well, let's just say this. I mean, what, what I can say, you know, publicly. Let's just say that they are not, um, you know, in any way 
exclusively tied to that particular solid state approach. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah, yeah I'm yeah, aware of that. Yeah. Actually, there's one that that kind of like moves into another thing. Um, uh, I don't know how you say it, Kuberg or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. They uh, they say that they've got a uh, a new separator that uh, that'll eliminate dendrites. Um, do you know anything about that? Yeah. Yeah. So Kuberg, they don't actually have they don't have a separator. The separator is a traditional separator, but they're using um, a liquid electrolyte with it, a yeah. conventional liquid to make uh, with the lithium ion. So that's the easiest thing to make work. It's just, you know, you use a regular liquid electrolyte, regular separator with lithium metal. The reason why that hasn't been done um, uh, uh, is because the lithium reacts with the liquid, right? And that has two, two side effects. One is there's a reaction side product that results in an insulating layer being formed that increases the resistance of the cell. So the, the yeah. capacity fades over time. Uh, and in their cell uh, data that they showed, they got less than 400 cycles before the cell hit the end of life, 80% cutoff. Uh, mm. That's not nearly enough for a car. And two is it forms dendrites uh, during charge, uh, and that's a fatal issue. So those two problems, and those have been the exact same problems that liquids had with lithium metal since the 70s. By the way, the first work on, on lithium batteries was done by people like Stan Whittingham, who was then at Exxon. And it was exactly that. It was a liquid yeah, electrolyte right. with lithium metal on the end, because that was the obvious thing to do, because it was more dense. And what they found was it started, you know, catching, reacting, on fire. catching fire, right? <laughs> so the way they solved the problem was to build a carbon anode where the lithium was held, instead of being held in a, as a metallic layer, it was held in an ionic state. That's why it's right. called lithium ion. Yeah, right. So the lithium, each lithium ion is trapped between six carbon atoms. So it worked as far as preventing dendrites, because lithium now could not form a metallic layer at all. But it introduced a lot of mass and volume and cost, right? And, 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 a, and a, a, a fast charge bottleneck, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so to just simply get rid of that with a liquid, it, it doesn't solve anything. It's just they're, they're going to have the same problems that, um, in fact, it's funny because the, the Kuberg uh, uh, founder uh, came out of uh, a Stanford group uh, led by Yi Shui, Professor Yi Shui, and he published a paper just last month where he showed that um, all the liquid electrolytes he tested um, you know, were um, uh, unstable to lithium metal, right? It just mm. didn't, it, it didn't, it had really limited calendar life. Um, so I think, you know, just because something is easy doesn't mean that it's, uh, it's going to work, right? Yeah. And, and this has been a hard problem. It's like saying, you know, if you want to get to the moon, the easy thing to do is start climbing, you know, the nearest tree, right? That gets mm. you off the ground and closer to the moon, you could argue, but it's a dead-end path. It's not going to get you to the moon. You're better off coming down, inventing rocket science, yeah. and then figuring out how to get to the moon. So just because it's easy to do, doesn't mean that it's going to get you to the goal. And liquids, you know, and sulfides and polymers are all easy to do, um, uh, but they are, um, they just don't work. And so there was no, from our view, Sandy, you know, there's just no way around doing the hard work. It took us 10 yeah. years of a lot of people spending a lot, burning a lot of midnight oil. Uh, and and uh, luckily we found it. There was a chance that we might not have been able to find the material. Luckily, mm -hmm. there was a material in nature, and the team found it, and that's kind of what brings us to where we are. And that's that's kind of what they call invention, I guess. Um, so I, there was one thing that we we talked about a second ago, and uh, that was, um, you know, if you heat up um, the uh, the battery pack, if mm -hmm. you're using solid state, similar to what Blue is doing, um, you can um, you can you can get them to work, and they're being used in uh, in buses and whatnot. Yeah. Mercedes is doing it right now. Um, and you mentioned 80, that's 80 Celsius, yeah. not, not 80 not Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. Exactly. So, uh, so anyway, um, um, what do you reckon the problem is? Or why, why, why didn't you dive into that? Why hasn't anybody dived in that well, direction? Well, because for a car, you need to work across the full temperature range, right? If you, if you uh, couldn't start your car uh, until after you know, a heater heated up the battery to 80 degrees Celsius, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that wouldn't be a very fun car to drive. Uh, you know, you, you, you're used to getting the car, it has to work. And then if you try to put a heater in, even if you wanted to put up with that, that annoyance, uh, it adds cost and, and, and uh, complexity and, 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 and uh, reduces the energy density and the range of the car, right? So batteries are already not meeting the requirements in terms of range and cost as it is. To add more cost and reduce the range further, is, that's moving in the wrong direction. So mm -hmm. you can't really, in a commercial, in a, for a mainstream car, there just isn't, you don't have the, the, the the margin to add cost or, or, or you know, mass or volume, uh, you got to go in the opposite direction. And so we think that any system that requires either heating 
or inordinately high pressure, like 10 atmospheres, yeah. or um, okay. you know, it doesn't work in the high current densities. It's just not, not practical. It's fine for lab demonstration. That's why for the last 40 years, people have been publishing papers in this space, right? But for 40 years, none of those papers has made it into you know, actual you know, commercial deployment mm -hmm. uh, outside of these uh, you know, the small niches like, like these you know, uh, fleet vehicles um, uh, that can be you know, recharged uh, you know, mm -hmm. at high temperature, right? Yeah. Well, I, um, I also, um, in my research and whatnot, uh, bumped into an article that was published in Seeking Alpha, um, and it said that you'd only get about 260 cycles or about 75,000 miles out of your battery, and this would be totally unacceptable. Um, so the data that you've shown me doesn't come that it beats the daylights out of that. So yeah, I mean, where, again, do, where does this come from? Well, so uh, I mean, <laughs> so uh, a lot of people that have a hidden agenda like to conflate different data, right? So uh, the data we've shown, we showed a couple of different data points. One is, as you point out, we get a thousand cycles to more than 80% yeah. under real world conditions at, at high rates of power, one C, one C, one hour charge and discharge. Again, that would be like charging your, your car at a Tesla supercharger every single time for a thousand cycles, mm -hmm. uh, and then discharging a 300 mile range battery in an hour, right? So 300 miles in an hour, uh, which is, you know, already bigger. That, that's our normal test protocol for a thousand cycles. In addition to that, we showed a track cycle, right? Uh, which was an aggressive cycle where you're constantly breaking and accelerating yeah. to the max around this track uh, uh, turns. Um, and then recharging between discharges at, at a 15 minute rate. On that test, a conventional battery, like a 2170 that you get from a Panasonic uh, that we tested here, uh, degraded 80% within 20 cycles, right? Within 20 cycles, the, the cell was already end of life. Uh, on that cell, we uh, uh, got, we showed over 100 cycles to about 90% capacity, right? So, um, uh, you know, to say that to say that, you know, because on that track cycle, we got, you know, uh, 100 cycles to 80%, 90%, that means the car doesn't get 1,000 cycles is ridiculous. It's like saying that Tesla only gets 20 cycles, right? Yeah. So it's still five times better than what you get with lithium-ion batteries. You know, the, uh, <laughs> the deal is, is that um, it sounds to me like people are getting some smidgen of um, information and then somehow they're extrapolating it and whatnot. Like the next one that I was, I've got down here that I, I really don't know how this works, but um, it's it's kind of like one of your ex employees or son of something anonymous ex employee, of course, um, uh, made some statements at Ford. When I was working for Ford Motor Company, you did stuff like that. You went to uh, you were definitely in court, and uh, maybe you went to jail uh, for giving away secrets mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. or what have you. Um, do you know of any of these people that used to be here that have uh, that have gone to the press or done things that? Well, those are unnamed sources, right? So that's the thing about unnamed sources. You have no idea, you know, if they're even real, if they even exist. You know, <laughs> I mean, uh, it's just one of those things. That's the problem with, with you know, that's why those those articles don't have a lot of credibility because they just, um, you know, uh, uh, they try to sensationalize stuff with these, uh, you know, uh, unnamed sources, right? In fact. Uh, that, that short seller report, I don't know if you saw our response to it in, in the tweets that we issued, but uh, in their own you know, uh, 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 you know, disclosures, they, they made clear that uh, the people that they claimed to have spoken to had left the company you know, years ago and might not have new information, mm -hmm. the information, and B, they were leaving out any positive things those people said. They were only reporting the negative stuff. Uh, we'll ah. send you the, the tweets. Uh, awesome can, can forward that to you. Uh, but it was kind of yeah. crazy. Uh, you know, that, that you would, I mean, it, it was so nakedly obvious what their goal was, right? Uh, uh, so anyway, uh, look, at the end of the day, we're, um, we're not a financial, you know, Wall Street company. We, we, we're making real stuff, real product yeah, for real yeah. companies. And, uh, you know, our, our belief fundamentally is that if we build a product and are solving a real customer problem, that we're going to create a lot of value for investors. Now, if that belief is wrong, then, you know, we're wrong. But... Uh, we, we believe in the system and that, um, you know, uh, if you can truly, you know, I mean, Tesla had a lot of detractors back in the day. You <laughs> yeah, <might. laughs> I was one of them <laughs> yeah. for a while anyway, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, yeah. I mean, yeah. if, 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 you, uh, if you're a detractor, um, I, I was basing what I said that uh, basically was hard one to swallow for yeah. the folks mm -hmm. over at Tesla or, or even the Tesla fans, hey, this is a bad build, and I was right. I, I have no problem telling people that's wrong, 
But when we got out of the skin and got into the technology, then I changed my tune. And, well, you, and you, that's kind of well, like what has the to thing, happen. The thing, I'll be honest here, the thing that, the thing that you know, I approach it like about you, Sandy, is you, you call it like you see it, right? I mean, uh, I remember the interview you did with Eli. I mean, he even acknowledged that, yeah, some of those you know, newer versions of their cars were, yeah. you know, early versions, were, were not really put together <laughs> as, yeah. you know, as, uh, in as polished a fashion as, as, as they should have been. And, and to, to his credit, they, they made it better. You know, they got feedback and they made it better. Uh, similarly here, what we're saying is, you know, um, we're not claiming that we are, you know, we've solved all the problems that are in full production now, because if we were, we'd be shipping cars, right? Yeah. But the yeah. parts of the problem we got to solve is a scale-up part of the problem. The question about whether the thing, you know, delivers the right cycle life, whether it works the right current density, whether it's dendrite, <coughs> whether it, you know, uh, th those are all, the data is out there, right? We publish the data, and the data mm. speaks for itself, right? Well, uh, uh, I, it's time for me to probably wrap yeah. it up, and, and it's funny, when I was when I was making my notes and what I, what I was going to ask, um, and we had to skip some of them just for time, but um, uh, I'm old. And uh, I can remember uh, a song that my dad used to play all the time on the radio anyway. And, um, and it was a Frank Sinatra song, and it said uh, something about some, some people get their kicks out of stomping on a dream. And, and to me, that is so perfect yeah. for these... These yeah. detractors that say, and and, he, yeah. and, and I never, uh, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not a tweeter, I, I haven't got time. But anyways, uh, it's funny that they would say, oh, we only, we only are publishing the negative stuff. Yeah. We're not going to tell you anything that. positive. Yeah, that's what they said. Well, yeah. isn't that stomping, that's, that's dream stomping at its finest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, and, I and people went yeah. for it. I mean, there's I videos out there that are just absolutely stunningly bad. And that's why I wanted to have this interview because I, I, I look at some of this stuff and I go, where is this coming from? And then I, I look at the end, you know, what's this guy's credentials and when I, you're not an engineer, you don't, you never, you never manufactured yeah. anything. Yeah. I mean, so where, yeah. why are they doing this stuff is, is like, a, yeah. this is, a, this is something where a psychiatrist, Psychiatrist yeah. needs to get involved because it's way over my yeah. head. But no, but he, here's where I'll summarize. So I'll, I'll say this as soon as we're wrapping up. There are a few key things you need to uh, create a great company and, and you know solve an important problem, right? Um, you need to have technology that works, right? Now we've shown that we've published the data. You've seen the data. But, you know, this is never before seen kind of results. So we're really excited about those results for solid state batteries, lithium metal anodes, uh, energy density, all power density. All those things are amazing. Number two is you need someone that wants to buy it, you need a customer, right? And, you know, VW's commitment has, you know, it's just could not be more clear. They've invested north of $300 million directly in the company. They've committed to build a manufacturing venture with us, 50-50 joint venture with us uh, to mass produce these things for use in their cars. Um, and they, they're on our board and they've, they've been partners for many, many years. Uh, plus there are other players besides those that we haven't announced. Number three, you need capital. It takes money to build, you know, real yeah. stuff, right? We have a billion five in the bank right now, right? So we've got the capital that we need. Um, so those three big, you know, uh, areas, we believe we already have, uh, you know, really good, um, you know, uh, uh, results in. And the last thing that's left is execution. Right? You got to basically, you know, be able to do the blocking and tackling required to put it all together. Yeah. Uh, we think we got a team that can do that. Um, the proof will be in the pudding, right? When we when we actually yeah. build these batteries and ship them to, to the market. Um, so if somebody <coughs> wants to stay on the sidelines now and say, you know, say, look, I want to, you know, uh, you guys are doing interesting stuff, but until you make it, you know, actually in cars, uh, I'm going to withhold my judgment. That's a valid position. Of course, um, if we execute at that point, then the company is worth a whole lot more. So yeah. whoever in c investors come in then, they're trading off risk versus reward. Uh, so um, someone's in the stock now is, you know, is, is placing a bet that we can execute. Uh, and if we do, then they get rewarded for that. Conversely, someone that sits it out now, um, you know, uh, is taking less risk, but um, is going to have less return as well. So that's yeah. a fundamental trade-off. But in our, from our view, as I said before, all the key pieces, the technologies, uh, the, uh, the, the, the capital, the customer uh, commitments are there. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it's kind of like we've been handed the ball on the field, and, you know, uh, we just got to make sure we don't fumble it, right? Yeah. There, there's, yeah. there's a path to the end zone. Uh, no guarantees we're not going to trip and you know, <laughs> lose but the ball. But. You, you mentioned three and sometimes four things, but there's a, there's a fifth element um, 
that I think you <laughs> you overlook, but you really shouldn't. Um, in order to make this work, you've got to have people that are dedicated oh, yeah. and whatnot, Huge. and Huge. that are willing to get Critical. up every day and come into work. And that is something that I was impressed with here. I, I've talked to a number of your guys. I'm kind of impressed. Thank you. you got people. Maybe it's some. I don't know, some uh, some freak of nature or something, but uh, but at the end of the <laughs> no. day, I'm looking at how many people are being drawn yeah. to your organization and yeah. to the Tesla organization and yeah. some of these other smaller companies that I've, I've, I've bumped into that have got tremendous amount of talent, and but even more importantly, um, a drive that, yeah. that seems to be lacking well, or missing in well, a lot of companies. First of all, thank you for, for, for you know, uh, commenting on that because we the team here absolutely is exceptional and and they are they are mission driven these are not guys that are just um here to you know draw a paycheck uh they basically want to you know make an impact on emissions and the climate and, yeah. and, and do that via, they want to see this battery on the road in real cars so you know, you know most of the team here uh, you know uh, many many members of the team have been around since you know for most of the last 10 years so yeah. uh these guys have you know um uh, if they were just short termers, uh, short timers, they, they'd have been, you know, really gone by now. Uh, and, and so, uh, uh, you know, uh, as long as we, you know, uh, w w to that point, I think if you have a big enough vision and you, and you have an ambition that is world changing, um, you know. So Larry Page says this sometimes. He says sometimes the, the hardest problems sometimes can be easier to solve than less hard problems because the hardest problems tend to attract the best people. Yeah, right? the best people want to do impactful things and if you have the best people then the problem it's like saying sometimes the, the the most difficult peaks if you're a mountain climber tend to be the ones that get summited because they draw the best climbers that want to climb those peaks sometimes a less important peak has been it goes unsummited because it's not interesting enough for the best people to, to take a stab at so that's kind of we feel like here because we have this big ambition of trying to really change the, the industry fundamentally with solid state lithium metal batteries um, we've been able to attract some really amazing people and uh, you know, we're just going to keep at it. We're going to just uh, do the blocking and tackling, keep working, uh, you know, ignore the noise out there. Uh, and if we can deliver and the customers like what we have, we're going to, you know, create a lot of value for everybody. Well, Jag Deep, this has been uh, really a good, good interview. I really appreciate Steady. you Pleasure. Uh, inviting me down. Thanks and, for coming uh, down, yeah. And so for all of the uh, folks out there that, um, that I normally talk to, uh, keep tipping those uh, cashiers. Uh, they still would like to have that. I know we're getting closer to maybe getting to the tipping point in this um, this little virus thing, but uh, but at the end of the day, um, keep tipping them. And thanks again. And we'll we'll come back to you with more more information that you might find interesting. Thanks again. Have a great day. Bye.